Hey guys, hey guys, hey guys. I'm so excited about today's conversation. We are going to be schmoozing with gangster rapper Nisim Black. So, waiting for all of you to start trickling in. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're just gonna give a minute for Nisim to come on. In the meanwhile, let's listen to one of Nisim's songs. I this one I was listening to in the car yesterday and it was so, so, so catchy. I just had it stuck in my head all day. So I wanna play it for you guys. Here's some new scene black to get us pumped before he comes on. This place is a dope. We are royalty. We must go back to our place in Kiswana. No, we are staying right here. This is the motherland. What's going all right? How you doing? How you doing? Ruth Hashem, Ruth Hashem. Doing well, doing, doing well. well. Doing all right, well. we just got punk. I hear my echo. I'm not sure if there's a way to, uh, to You're get... You're here for me, so it's not out here. Okay, let me see. Now let me see if it went away. If it went away. Mm -hmm. I still hear it, but we're just going to rock with it. We're just going to rock with it. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. 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 All right, so we were just getting pumped listening to your motherland bounce. Mm -hmm. which full disclosure i was listening to it with my son yesterday he's two and a half years old and he had it stuck in his head all day <laughs> <laughs> so cute um all right before before we jump in and get to know who we see black is let me uh share with everyone who's joining us a little bit about you so Nisim Black has been a gangster rapper, a gang member, a faith seeker, but it is his current incarnation that is here to stay. African-American Hasidic Jew who brings sharp beats and hooked filled rhymes to the masses. All right. Well, that's just a short intro, but now let's actually get to hear from you. All right. Nisim, where are you in the world right now? Right now, I am in Israel, in Beit Shemesh. Uh, I'm here. Uh, Prime Minister is here. Biden is here. 
So that means there's a lot of traffic here. I cannot go to Jerusalem. I had a lot of things to do in Jerusalem, but I could not. <laughs> but I'm here in Beit Shemesh. That's where I am. That's my home. Amazing. Amazing. All right. So you're really in the motherland. I have a question. Is it possible to have this conversation without the ear pods? Because some people are saying that they hear my echo. For sure. One second. Okay. Please. And I have these in my ear for sure. There we go. All right. Can everybody hear Nisim? Can you say something, Nisim? Test, test, one, two, one, two. All right. I hear you, which probably means yeah. everybody else hears you. All right. Okay, um, okay. so Nisim, from the streets of Seattle to the streets of Ramat Beit Shemesh, you said Beit Shemesh? Yeah, I'm in Beit Shemesh now. I don't hang out too much in the streets, but I definitely hang out in Beit Shemesh a whole lot more these days. <laughs> oh, man, thank you. So, so t tell us a little bit. Tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in Seattle. What was like? Who who is the soul behind the social, behind the face? Like who who is Nisim as a child? So Nisim as a child, well, I grew up um, definitely to hip hop parents. Both my mother and my father were both hip hop artists in the early nineteen eighties. Um, and in addition to that, they also both sold drugs. I was a young kid, you know, I think maybe nine years old when I started like smoking weed. And when I started running with street gang or whatever, I was around 12, 13 years old, I started selling drugs also myself. So I grew up in that type of environment. My my mother my and my father, my biological father actually split when I was two. And she later on got another relationship where she eventually married to my stepfather was, was my dad. He raised me. Uh, but he was in the same business as my father. And so I was very much so um, brought up as an inner city kid, you know, witnessing the, you know, everyday, you know, violence and drug use and abuse that was going on. Um, and that was just sort of normal for us. I grew up with that being normal, coming home and seeing, you know, uh, drugs all over the place and being in the trafficking house. My house used to have maybe... 30, 40 people there, you know, just on any given day, people were going in and out of my house constantly. So I grew up in that. Um, and I think, like, at that point, uh, religiously, nobody in my family was was religious, but my grandfather was. He he had spent most of his time in prison. That's my mm -hmm. father, my mother's father. And when he actually came home for parole, he was home for parole, he came to live with us. And so while he lived with us, he taught me Islam. He was a Muslim. I went with him to mosque as a kid, and for like a whole year, year and a half that he was out, um, uh, he stayed by us pretty much off and on. But I prayed with him, you know, pretty regularly, and went to him, went with him to mosque on Fridays at least, and um, and that was like my religious experience in the beginning. So after that, he went to prison, um, where he was unfortunately until the rest of his life which he passed away, I think maybe 2013, I think it was. And, but from that point on, I'd always would, would have said I was a Muslim until I was about 13 years old. Then there was a, um, there was a hip hop program at a Christian place that went there. That place became like a safe haven for me. And I really honestly believe like initially that place really saved my life, really did. Being there, the relationships I built there at the Union Gospel Mission were very, very good people. And it came at a very crucial and critical time for me. And uh, that was sort of like my upbringing. And that's how everything started. Wow, wow, wow. So what was it like being a child? And I, you know, I, just, I wanna, I wanna like try to, you know, obviously I can't be in your shoes, but I, I wanna right. try to get some of that insight. So what it's like for you as a child, seeing 30, 40 people coming in and out of your house every single day, like what did you think was going on? Was it just normal? Was that just the way it was? Honestly, you become very accustomed to, to, to the things that are happening in your environment very easily, you know, like, so for as a kid, I like, that was just normal. I got used to that, you know? And I think one of the biggest things why, I'm um, going to the the Christian center was good for me is because it kind of got me out of the house. And I never knew until I'm looking back at it why I had this thing where I just like never like being home. You know what I mean? Like I did not like being at home. Um it, it, you know home home had a sense of comfort for me obviously, but there was always this element of like I need to go stay somewhere else. Or I want to go to somebody else's house. So I wanted to be out. So that sort of gave me that place, that safe haven for me. But it it 
it, it did have effect on me, but at the time I thought it was just normal, but it did have an effect on me in, in the way that, uh, obviously the way I'm looking at things now is completely different than what they were back then, to be honest. But uh, the way I see life now, I notice about myself, I don't like being in places where there's a lot of people. All right. Wow. So, and I didn't know this about myself until I was able to learn myself. So it probably had more of a, a, a deep effect on me um, growing up emotionally more than what I thought. But um, at the time, I thought this was just normal life. Wow. 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 Now, now you know, I, it, it, it's obvious that you've been through a lot and you've come very far. You've come very far and you, you it, it's almost like you have multiple incarnations in one lifetime. Right. And, and from a from a Torah perspective, okay. you know, we say that everything that Hashem does is for the good. Right. Everything right. is Gamza Litova. So looking back at your childhood experiences and then I want to move into like your life more recently. But looking back at your childhood experiences, um, how could you share with our listeners you know, the, the good that came out of the challenges that you've experienced as a child? I think the, the good was, was the fact that, you know, being in those type of environments, you learn how to deal with people. You know, with a lot of people coming in and out of your house, you deal with a lot of different personalities. I feel like a lot of that shaped me for who I am now. I didn't know, you know, years you know, years later, I would be somebody with the with the bigger platform and with people knowing who I am and nonstop, never having a break now. So, like, like what was going on in my house is happening, apart from the drug activity, but it's happening in my everyday life. And nonstop, I'm seeing so many different people, whatever. And I, I think I have pretty good customer service because I was used to dealing with a lot of people and a lot of different personalities, you know, in my house all the time. Um, so because of that, I think it helped me in that way. Um, I think another thing was is that, you know, when she, once you go through things, you, you build character, you become a stronger individual, no matter, you know, who the person is, if it doesn't, if it doesn't break you, it will help you grow. Um, so I seen that a lot. And there was a lot of beautiful qualities. Like you have to realize nobody was like hustling and doing those things. Like, you know, my dad wasn't doing those things because he just enjoyed it. He was actually trying to support his family. I seen the stress that he went through when things weren't getting paid and when he, you know, had to hustle and, and they were working for a while, a legitimate, you know, business and job. And then when that went under, it was like back to the streets and, 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 and seeing resilience and trying to do something, even though that, that was something illegal, but the reason why was because, you know, in order to keep food on the table and to be able to take care of your family, support your family. So all of those things came through you know, um, what what would appear to be like complete darkness, but there was actually light there. So there was a lot of different things that I learned um, from that. Wow. wow, wow. And and do you do you feel like all of that contributed to to why you chose the path of Torah Judaism today? Um, technically, no. What I say with Judaism was something much deeper. Um, I always had a very strong cognizance of God, even as a kid, um, even in the midst of the environments that I was in. I always felt very deeply that um, that God was very aware of, of, of who I was and what I was. I, I knew this as a kid. I don't know why I knew this. It wasn't conversations that I was having. Um, and and to some degree, I always felt a bit different. I always felt a bit different, a little bit um, out, of, out of place um, to some degree. And that would really manifest itself maybe in my 10th grade year of high school, um, of which for no apparent reason, I remember coming in for my lunch break and I just had this moment. Everything just stopped. Now, by this time, I was 16 years old. I had a mega experience at this Christian camp when I was around 14 years old. Um, I had stopped smoking weed when I was 13. Um, so I was for sure clean when I had this trip out. I wasn't high, okay? I'm just saying that for a disclaimer. Um, I remember walking in. It was my, my 10th grade year of high school, like maybe midway through the year, and I just had like some type of like crazy like epiphany or something. I don't know. And everything stopped, and it's almost as if everything got silent. I'm looking around, and I just felt something inside saying, you don't belong here. 
you know, balloon can. I felt so out of place. This feeling trips me out even still to today because it was it was it was something that was so strong. And I was looking around at all my friends, people that I grew up with, and I felt something inside. And I felt like I knew something that nobody else knew. But it wasn't like I knew what it was that I knew, but I just felt like I knew something. So I was joked, I say I ate a chicken nugget and the whole experience stopped. But it was shortly after, after it was finished, I remember just sitting there and thinking like, God's trying to talk to me. He's trying to say something. I really felt like that was a godly experience. I had no idea. So I went back to, you know, um, the, the, the Union Gospel Mission that I was involved in. I got involved in every single program and internship and everything. And I talked to my counselor about it. And I got involved with the, uh, I became a junior missionary. And I started getting more and more kids involved and more, you know. So um, there was always something that felt different. I just didn't really know what it was. And it wasn't until, you know, I was I was having my moment. I don't know if you want me to speak about the Jewish, how I came into the Jewish faith. Absolutely. Because I just, I just want to, like, ask a, a question on a point that you made. You said, like, I felt okay. like I was different, that you couldn't really pinpoint what it was. It was a feeling. <clears throat> Have you had exposure to Judaism before, prior to this feeling? Yeah, I did. Because I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood. So I used to walk through a shul every day to go to my elementary school, uh, Graham Hill in Seward Park. So I used to go cut through, you know, the, uh, the Ashkenazi synagogue and then be, be, tw be behind the Sephardi synagogue. I used to ride my bikes. You know, we used to have like our little ramps and whatever we were making the parking lot over there. Um, after you'd have told me that the same shoe I was playing basketball outside of, I'd be a Jew, you know, several years later, I wouldn't have believed you. But um, so I did have exposure, but I didn't have, um, a lot of interactions, you know, as, as, as you know, generally a Jewish community keeps to themselves. So I didn't have um, interactions with people that were Orthodox. There were some people that were not Orthodox that lived in the neighborhood that I did have interaction because some of the kids were going to the same school as me. Um, very, very sweet people. But I didn't have a actual Jewish um, uh, experience, I would say. Okay, so, I mean, all right, fine. So you grew up in, like, a Jewish neighborhood. You'd walk by the shuls. You know, I <clears throat> I grew up in a neighborhood where there were, like, churches and mosques, but I never felt a pull to to enter or to, you know, it's not like I, I felt a calling in that direction. So I'm curious, I'm curious, like, uh, to hear more about how that transition happened for you. So what happened was I found myself maybe, I think I was, after I was 19 years old, my mother had just passed away from an overdose. And it was very, very tough for me. Uh, my mother was like, was like my best friend. Um, by this time, maybe two or three years by this time, I had already been dating my wife, who was going to be my wife. Me and my wife are high school sweethearts. Um, so she was really like an anchor for me and somebody that, you know, she really gave up everything, uh, especially after my mother, because she had built a good relationship with my mother also, too. She moved in with my family and helped us out. A lot of it, she gave up college, everything. And um, we just really tried to figure out and start a new life for for, for ourselves, even. Um, so I ended up moving out, and I had uh, I had an independent record label that I was a part of, and that also ran half of the company. And I was releasing music at this point. I, I was in discussion with a major record label. Um, at that point, the biggest thing in rap at that point was probably 50 Cent. Chetty Shekel, they call him over here. And uh, so 50 was like big. And so what the labels really wanted was gangster rap. So I had fallen into this trap of like trying to remake, you know, gangster rap, like hood music. The thing was is that at the time that I'm trying to make it, it's like, this is not my lifestyle right now, but I, I'm willing to pretend and, and fake this in order for, you know, for, for to be able to get this contract. Um, and what, what I saw was that I started to lose myself. I started to, you know, fall back into behaviors that were not necessarily, um, were, were not necessarily representing where I actually was in life or where I thought I was. So ultimately my, friends my inner circle changed again and the people that you know that i was around that i was running with um and no fault to their own people that i i, I love and love dearly 
but it just wasn't like the environment for a person who's trying to grow closer to God. So I ended up, uh, you know, getting a, a demo or a, a song that came to me from a friend brought it in that this other rapper had made about me. I put out my independent um, CD, started making a lot of noise. And there was another artist who wanted to get himself out. So he, you know, thought to start up, you know, a beef between me and him. He made a made a song about me. And uh, instead of making a song back, we went to go fight him at a nightclub. And so that led to a kill or be killed situation. A friend of mine went to go and uh, take his life afterwards. And he, he shot everything except for the guy. And so the problem was that he ended up in prison. And for me, now I'm left with a case where people think that I just sent somebody to shot to shoot them. And if they don't come and handle, which is rightfully so, they're thinking like, you know, uh, nobody's going to go call the police, right? So we got to handle the situation ourselves. So it put me in a predicament where I felt like it was a kill or be killed situation. And from that, the only thing I knew how to do was pray because I feel like once you flirt with a particular lifestyle, especially that was not, wasn't something that was cushioned to who I was. It wasn't who I was anymore, for sure not. Uh, but even at my essence and my core, I was never the type of person. I felt like I could take a person's life. Like, you know what I mean? It, it was never that serious for me. So um, I started praying. That's why I started praying. And I naturally uh, went back into what I knew, which was the normal Christian way, normal Christian path that I started. I ended up squashing the beef with the other guy. And as I'm home, spending a lot of time at home, I pick back up the Bible and I start going through everything. And I had so many different questions. I was all over the place. I started going on YouTube and trying to find, you know, answers to all my questions and different things like that. And I I spent a lot of time in the beginning watching debates between creationists and evolutionist scientists. And that was like a springboard to me, like going down this rabbit hole and then clicking this video called Zeitgeist Refuted. Zeitgeist Refuted was a movie against Zeitgeist, but I don't even know what Zeitgeist was, but I can conclude what it was about, which it was trying to connect uh, Christianity to a lot of different, um, a lot of different uh, ancient pagan, pagan religions. Uh, but so Zeitgeist Refuted was basically saying, okay, you're right about Christmas, you're right about Easter, you're right about all these other things, because they do, they're, they're completely uh, pagan in nature, but Jesus was Jewish. And then I said, go on. That's right. He was Jewish, you know? So I, then that was like the first tickets for me to start really thinking. And then they started mentioning about Shavuos and Pesach and all these other things. And I started going into my Bible. It's like, I've read this so many times. How come I never paid attention to that? How come I never paid attention to the fact that there's different names for the months that, that are inside the actual Tanakh? I'm, you know, I, I, so I found, I went down this crazy route of trying to find out like what's happening. And it was so... Um, so crazy because my natural thing after, and this, this went on for a while, but my natural processing was, was like, okay, everybody has to go to court. I need a Quran. I need a few different versions of the Christian Bible. I'm going to get the Jewish Bible, which I didn't know what it was at the time. So I ordered a JPS Tanakh. I had a complete Jewish Bible, which was like a messianic, whatever. And I was going through all these different books and that also to researching stuff online for about eight hours a day. That's what I was doing. Eight hours a day, eight hours a day. Wow. I started after this, I started fasting. I was going three days a week, no food. And I was going out crying to God till my eyes was bloodshot red. Because now whatever this, this original feeling was of, of trying to find my essence and trying to find who I is and what that relationship was to God. Now everything is like, it's to the max. This this feeling of trying to search after God and find who God is was like crazy. And so through the fasting and all that, I would say this time led me, it led me to a very, very spiritually sensitive time. I felt like Hashem was hugging me this whole entire time that I was going through this. And um, for many different reasons, through a process of elimination that I had, I ended up with right. just the Tanakh. And I think originally was a complete Jewish Bible. And I remember setting it down on the on the table, which included was like a Messianic version, because I also included the New Testament. Where I remember sitting down on the table and I'm saying, I'm going to start over from scratch. I'm going to have to re-get myself into the faith. And I told God like this, I said, I'm going to start this book. I'm going to read from cover to cover. 
but I'm only looking for your character. I want to know what you love. I want to know what you hate. I want to know. And I read the whole entire Tanakh. I went through Tanakh. I didn't read the New Testament, the Greek Hadashah, the, the Christian version. I went only, and I stopped after that for some reason, because I, I felt like I was very familiar with this. So I started over again from Bereshis. And then I read it twice. And the kisufim and yearning and the fire that was burning inside of my heart at this point and and the things that were going on like were supernatural i can't say all of it you, you'll think i'm nuts but i went through a crazy amount of things going through the, the, through this time me and my wife trying to figure out where we're going to be so the first place we ended up was in a messianic congregation because we felt like we were the only ones on the island it was me my wife my brother-in-law my sister-in-law and then after being there for maybe about two and a half years, um, I, at some point, everything I typed in on Google, it, it was no longer like a bunch of Messianic people. Chabad.org was coming up. So the more I started to learn Chabad because I, I was at a Messianic place that was very well advanced. It wasn't a Messianic place like today where you have a lot of people like church. This one was actually, it was very from in its nature. There was a beautiful Aaron Kodesh. They would read from a Sefer Torah. They were davening Hebrew from an art school Sidor. And also these things were culture shock for me. So I had to go find out what's going on here. So the more and more I actually started learning about actual like Yiddishkeit and I started learning Halacha and I started learning more and more. Um, uh, there was some Tanya over there, Rabbi Krasnansky and Rabbi uh, 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 Mendel Kaplan used to watch his things on, on Chabad.org. Those were the first things that really made me go, hold on, I need to start rethinking everything. It got deeper. It got very, very deep for many different reasons. And I started to look at the scriptures very differently. So when you're spending a lot of time um, with Hashem, you start to have the same ratzonus, the same will, the same wants that Hashem wants. And so um, they they were doing this major like conference where they were uniting all these different uh, messianic groups. And one of the things they told us before we went was, whatever you do, don't talk to the Orthodox rabbis in the lobby. Don't 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 speak to them. You know they're just gonna it's anti missionaries. And I went and instead of going in, I think I went in on Shabbos only on Shabbos for the rest of the conference. I did not go in. I hung out with the rabbis. They told me not to, which was Rabbi Michael Skoback. And Rabbi Eli Cohen from Jews for Judaism. And I threw them all my kashas, all my questions that I had on everything with the connection. It was beautiful because they knew uh, Torah very well. So after that, I never went back. And eventually my wife came to me and said she wanted to start a Garus. And I was a little hesitant because I didn't want to be the only black Jew. And <laughs> Hashem arranged that uh, Arab Shabbos, I run into a good friend of mine now, Yaakov London, um, who I didn't know at the time, who invited me for Shabbos. He was also black. And we started going to him for Shabbos and then other people and inside the very neighborhood that I grew up, everything came full circle. Now, that's it, like on an external level. And then eventually we converted. Um, but like the, the spirituality, the heightened spirituality of what that feeling was and what that light and that fire is, there's almost no way to ever give that over. Right. I can really give over like, you know, so that's by the time I get to Yiddishkeit. And there's so many different sheetas and so many different, some people more rational, some people not. Like I experienced Tashim on a crazy level, like, you know, crazy, crazy level. So I don't go for any rationality. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying rationality. I'm saying being a uh, rational, but that doesn't work for me because I experienced Tashim like in a crazy way. And nobody can take that from me. Right. So this, my whole entire journey to Yiddishkeit was just one of just fire and searching for Hashem and Hashem and feeling that Hashem was very close to me. And the more and more I grew, uh, and the more and more that I knew, I grew with it. So I didn't feel like a major, um, like something's lacking or, you know, by the time I was ready to start keeping Shabbat, start keeping kosher, I, didn't feel, I already fell in love with Hashem. So it wasn't like when the, I'm looking for the next thing that I can do in order to be pleasing. So that was sort of um, that experience. So I get very passionate when I talk about No, I love your passion is just like captivating. I'm like, I want to know everything. <laughs> do we have five hours? Okay, we don't have five hours. But but what, what I want to know, because you keep you keep saying like I experienced Hashem, I experienced God in this crazy way, in this crazy way. Like, And, and so, you know, I, I can imagine that some of the people listening, if not everyone, wants that crazy connection. Like, who doesn't? Whether it manifests in, you know, sh shopping, drugs, addiction, whatever. That, that is just a manifestation of this deep yearning for connection. Right. 
Is it right. something you feel was just gifted to you? Or is there something you can tell people, you know, this is what you do to get that crazy, undescribable connection? Right. So there, there's there's two things. There's that's this a yes and it's a no. Was it a gift? Yes, and then there's no. Right? It it's 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 yes because Hashim doesn't have to 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 manifest to give his presence into to anybody's life if he doesn't want to. But at the same time, there are Chazal tells us that Hashim works Mida can make it Mida. The same way that we are with Hashem, the same way that he is with us. And and the way that manifests is a certain Gemara that talks about that, you know, the, the Yosef at Sadiq. Why 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 is it that the sea split? It was because of the bones of Yosef at Sadiq. So they asked the question, what did Yosef at Sadiq do? Since he ran from the wife of Potiphar, he split, so the sea split. That Hashem had to return to him the exact same, you know, um type of type of you know miracle. Um, something that was above nature because he acted in a way that was above his nature. And so when we sort of sacrifice, or most, and I don't know, most of Nefesh is very hard to translate into sacrifice or self-sacrifice, whatever it is, ourself, in order to come close to God, then he comes closer to us. So on, on some level, we don't need our, ourselves. We don't, we don't, we don't, we can't say like, oh, I did this, so therefore God did this, right? So, but it is in a way that Hashem made a contract that, listen, if you come close to me, then I'll come close to you. Um, mm -hmm. So there is that part of it. But then we also know that in the beginning of things, there's a certain light that that Hashem gives, just like in Bereshis, we see this light where it says, Vayihi Or, right? So all the, the commentaries that the Gemara says, and and the Ramchal is very famous for saying that this ore, this light that Hashem brought at the beginning was the same light that he tucked away for the tzaddikim at the end. And this ore ganus is very, very beautiful light. Hashem does the same thing when a person is real about the relationship. At the beginning, they get this wonderful light. And then, wow, it's hidden. Mm. And then they have to do all this. It's like, Hashem, what happened? Where'd you go? What, the, what, you know, what, the, what just happened? We had this thing, you know? And then you have to figure out what it is that you have to do to be there. And it's almost like a baby with their hands out, walking, and Hashem saying, okay, come, 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 and waiting till you can feel his hands again. So the requirement for that is, is the same way that you did it the first time. What was the first one? Is that I was most selfish, that I gave up everything to find you, Hashem. So then you get into a certain place. So what's the next stage? Oh, you become religious. Now I'm religious, whatever. So then what happens? Hashem is hiding because... Now you, you think you want something because you're doing stuff. Oh, now I'm doing the godly things. And then all of a sudden, you could be doing things and forgetting whose things you're doing. Right? Mm. So then now it's is hidden again. So then it goes back to the heart. I don't, it says in, 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 I, in the book of Isaiah, and I think it's around the 11th chapter where I, Shem says that, I don't, I don't want your, your, your Shabbat, your Rodesh Kodesh, and your Korbanas, all these things are detestable to me. And it's like, well, God, you commanded these things from us. He says, no, I wanted you. I wanted your heart. This is what I wanted from you. Mm -hmm. And so a person has to realize that even I can become religious with the very thing, things that God wants, but then I have to figure out the reset button when I feel like, wow, Hashem's distant from me again. I have to do something again. So I found for me, and I think that the main Nakuda is this, is what I was doing before then that I didn't know now I'm a breast lover, so it makes sense. But back then I had no idea what it was. It's just simply talking to Hashem, spending time with Him. You know, from Parsha's Vice Khan and Moshe Rabbeinu and Devarim, I forget where Vice Khan actually starts, where the Pasuk starts, but Moshe Rabbeinu says, I think Rashi was like, Hashem, he was praying so much to Hashem, Hashem had to say, let me go. He was grabbing on to Hashem, let, he said, Hashem could say, cut me loose, Moshe, stop praying, be quiet, mm -hmm. right? And that's the type of thing where when when we realize how much we need Hashem and we realize how much He means to us and, and, and everything that 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 everything is 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 dependent upon our relationship with Hashem, then 
we would never let him go. We'd be screaming and crying every second that we feel that he's not there again. And, and I know I'm speaking a lot about feelings. I know there's a lot of people that's like, well, we have to do, regardless if we feel or whatever. There's a very beautiful sefer by Yom Dachacha, written by uh, Talmud of Rabbi Jimaya, based on his teachings, that says that, yeah, that's true. It doesn't remove the fact that we have to do, but what what person in their right mind will give a gift that didn't want you to have pleasure with the gift? You don't, you're not supposed to have a hana. There's no pleasure that's supposed to come from it. So at the same time, we should seek Hashem's pleasure and we should find it pleasurable because since the Arizal got to his level only because he took he took the simple with all the mitzvahs. So um yeah, I'm sorry. But well, I no, think the no, main thing dude, is that talking to Hashem and clinging and, and fighting and, and pining. And, and and that's the way to always re reignite the flame. Most people see that once they feel that, okay, maybe I had some spark in the beginning and then it wanes again and, and the person goes back and sees, you know, when a person stalls out in the diet, sometimes the body shuts down. Person sometimes don't realize, sometimes it's a real stall, but sometimes it's just like, I started eating things that I really, that, that really wasn't. I took a street here, took a street there. I was snacking a little bit. And then afterwards, it's hard for you to see the cheshbon of how much food you ate, you know? So, but um, it is wow. what it is. Wow. I feel like it's so easy to to have a conversation with you because of your passion. It just shines through. And so I, I want to, you mentioned, you mentioned that you um, are a breast lover. So am mm -hmm. I, am I correct in assuming that you do a lot of heat um, and if right. the answer is yes, can you tell our listeners a what that is and mm -hmm. what that experience is like for you to do heat bodedut? So heat bodedut, uh, which is in the, in the way that it comes out from Reb Nachman's form, Reb Nachman's, uh, who was the founder of Breslau Hasidus, who uh, was maybe more than more than two hundred years ago now. Um, he built to do it the way that he reintroduced it was um, by a way that we all know, simply speaking to Hashem from your own words and your own heart to set aside time. Um, his, his his advice was simply at least one hour um, of 60 minutes on the clock of um, set aside time to really go in and to speak with Hashem and to speak with God and to talk about, you know, uh, to make a, uh, how you say, uh, Gosh, it's an internal accounting, like an accounting yeah, of accounting. Mm -hmm. Right, to make an accounting of, of everything you did in the in the past 24 hours um, of your life. If, if it's only 24 hours or at any time, you can make truth on anything that you remember. But to spend some time with God going and recounting those things, not only that, but it's even a bigger thing to calculate your good points, the good things that you did. Um, and, and to later on at the end to not only to praise God but also to to request of God the things that you want. Um depending and you on what, to do this out loud. Out to talk it out loud. Out loud. You speak to God out loud, uh with no distractions, uh best in a in a in a private room or in a or in a forest. Um Christians know very well about a prayer closet, you know. My wife used to do this even as a kid. She used to go and lock herself in a closet and go pray to God. You know, I was doing this in my room at 15 years old, long before Brussels. But it, it's it's something that it just it just mommish works. You know, it just, it works. just mommish so, works. So, so, what, what would you tell people who you know? I, I'm at the point now where I also I'm talking to God all day, every day, and everything that mm -hmm. I do, it's just He's just like my invisible friend or, or visible mm -hmm. friend. And now, right. now, but. It's re when I first started talking out loud to God, it was really hard because it's like, God, where is God? I felt like I was talking to a wall, which is really mm -hmm. hard to not, you know, it's easy to talk to you because there's a responsiveness. Um, mm -hmm. It feels like a two-way street when you're talking to another person. But when you're talking to God, it almost feels like you're talking to yourself and you feel like a yeah. so So how would you tell someone to break past that barrier when they're first starting to talk to God and they just feel like, oh, it feels like I'm talking to a wall. This is a little weird. So the first thing is, I would say, is to create an environment. You know, what is a, what is a, you know, a, a couple do after many years of marriage and then they realize that like it's hard to speak to the other person again. We've been together for a long time. Like I don't really have words. Like you know, it's easy for me to talk to my friends because there's always new things. It's like a degree of separation or something that's new. But how many chidushim do you have? How many new things do you have when you're in the marriage? So 
what has to happen is that you make the time and you set aside the time. The first thing is that, that we do is we set aside the time. I'm going to make this time. It's closed off for me and God. Number two, one thing that I found over the years that is, 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 is from what I've seen, has not been discussed so much in the breast of Sephora, but and I, it's not a Kiddush because I'll tell you where I got it from. It's not something new because I'll tell you where I got it from. Um, I would make a would make a a environment for godliness. And for me, this is even way back when I used to light incense. I would light candles in that room. I would put on very, very soft music. And I would sit and try to meditate and get myself in a place to where I felt um, a sense of, of of closeness to God, to where it's going to be even easier for me to speak to him because I felt like I need to be able to get myself in a place. Where did I get it from? Is I was reading with completely no context, no no commentaries, no Torah about pay, no oral, no nothing. I'm just reading Tanakh. I'm reading the Bible. I'm reading the Torah. Hashem is very uh, stringent and machpid about the fact that He wanted that the base of Mikdash or the, or the Mishkan to have a certain feel, a certain environment. There were beautiful bread smell that was in that place, and incense, and kitaros, and and there was a menorah that that was lit. There were there were curtains that created an ambience. And the Levim singing, right, that created an ambience of godliness, right, in that place. So we have to create a little, we, we have to keep that inside but for the Mikdash Me'at, but at the same time to create a space in a room to where it's easier to talk to God because you welcome them into your place. So that helps to also start thinking and get the thinking process going, and then it opens up, and it's easy. A person get to that place, you may just start crying, you know. And you yeah. created that yourself by creating an environment that you're welcoming Hashem into that place. Yeah. And I think that once you do that, then it becomes more and more of a reality to the person that Hashem is there. Right? Yeah. You've created this thing where Hashem is actually there. You, the presence is 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 more real to you, and then now you can open up. But I think that's a big thing that never really gets talked about enough. It's like what that environment is that I speak to God in because then I can I can open up my heart. You may not have every time, but I think, you know, the more and more person sets aside time and they try to do that to prepare for it, it's it, it can make a, all the world a difference. I really love that because I'm a person, if, if anyone has ever been to my home, you'll know I really value turning my home into my temple. And you walk right. in and it's just good vibes. And, you know, they say your external reality has an impact on your internal reality. And so I love this whole idea of, you know, almost like creating a little section, which is an altar between you and Hashem so that you have those, um, those items to attach to, to make you feel connected internally. And like, I really, really appreciate that. I now, mean, right. Think about it. Think about like, think about it this way. Like, you know, you could you could be in a certain place and having a good time with friends and somebody walks in and just kills the whole entire mood, right? So we see these things in the negative all the time that you can be in a place and just the whole entire thing just like go down because of certain individuals. Certain, so think about it the other way. You're just flipping it around like I need to purify the air, you know, purify the air. And so that's 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 sort of what it is. It's like, let me, you're doing a, a, a spiritual uh, humidifier. You know, in order for for God's presence to be in there, and, and then after that, you speak. You go on to the next question. I'm sorry. No, clap. This is this is wonderful. Really great. Now, now, okay. So, so you you came you as a convert, right? As a convert, had one type of lifestyle, and you completely did a makeover to this new lifestyle, uh, Hasidic Judaism. And now, now. You know, I can, in my own way, relate to that as a Baal Tshuva. You know, I was born Jewish, but I went on this path in my 20s uh, where I was strongly um, living a Hindu lifestyle. I lived in India for six years at an ashram. I had a guru, statues everywhere, a Bodhisattva. By the way, that's very Jewish. Go ahead. <laughs> It's become very Jewish over the years. It's true. It's true. It's so true. It's so true. <laughs> and, and you know, so so after six years of of 
being in that lifestyle, I was in meditation and like similar to, to what you shared, it's just like this feeling. I had a feeling. This voice mm. in my head said, leave this country now and go to Israel. Mm. Seemingly wow. out of nowhere. 30 mm. minutes later, I had my flight booked. I was on a plane the next day with nowhere to sleep, no plan, no nothing. You know, and it was just, I, I was open to divine guidance. I said, God, wherever you are, whoever you are, just guide me. I am surrendered. I am yours. And I found that once I arrived to Israel, because I was surrendered to that divine guidance and I allowed God to take me where I was meant to be without overthinking the process, mm -hmm. you know, I found that he brought into my life the right people at the right time to aid me on my journey. And so my, my second week in Israel, I was at a Shabbat meal. It was me, Rabbi Danielle Katz from the Elevation series and Rabbi Avraham Sutton. Okay. And wow. And just me, and it's me just like asking them all of these questions. Now, that that experience, having those people guide me, helped me anchor into my Torah lifestyle. That said, that said, you know, the first couple of years was challenging because I had a whole, my childhood pre-India, then my experiences in India, and a part of me felt like, wait a minute, how do I amputate who I was? Because it's so ingrained in me still, but yet some of it opposes this new lifestyle that I've chosen, right? So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have a similar experience where, you know, you, had, you were brought up one way, chose Torah Judaism because you felt like you had no choice. This is just truth. You know, now, mm -hmm. how do you integrate who you were with who you are. Did you have to amputate that part of you or do you fe still feel like it's a big part of who you are today? So I, 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 I feel like it's very interesting um, because I sort of feel like this me was always hidden by the other me. You understand? So I don't really feel... Um, as if this is not something that was always with me, I felt like it was just taking off more garments, more garments, more garments as, as more information was coming um, that would that would challenge me, then another layer of garments were, co were, were coming off of me. So my initial thought was, the first thing was, I'm going completely left. Like, you have to think about it. Like, I, I want to I paint this picture to you. And and people that grew up in urban neighborhoods or grew up in the hood at any affiliation, they know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Like to a certain degree, we'll talk about just things on the outer, on the outer appearance of a person, right? Like if I um, was to go and, and, and dress the way that I used to dress, I used to wear, you know, baggy pants. Nobody wears baggy pants today, but back in the day when I was, you know, out there, everybody, you know, sagging, I went to my baseball cap and different things like that, right? And you take a person who, um, some, you know, white kid just coming from suburban area, didn't dress like that, whatever. Like, I I had a bigger danger on me from from getting robbed or whatever else. I wouldn't say necessarily robbed, but ended up with a beef with somebody just like going to a gas station, you know, and I look at somebody a certain way, then that can, that can cause me to have conflict, possibly lose my life just from looks. You understand what I'm saying? So, and, and, and that will, a lot of it, like we think about this thing, it's crazy when you think about this, you know, like there's been cases. And I remember back when this Trayvon Martin case, I don't want to get into crazy social political things, but like, think about it from a hood perspective, like, that was the first thing I thought was like, if I keep dressing like this, people, I, I, how could I take myself serious? So the first thing I was, was I changed my lubrish. I didn't go, I didn't go Hasidish immediately. I put on a nice collared shirt and I put on regular pants. And it's one of those things that I wouldn't think about like the white people that were going to treat me different. In the hood, they treated me different. When the kids see me different, then this already meant something different to them. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it was no longer that issue. It went from, yo, bro, where you from, or different things like that, to, hey, how you doing, sir? You know, from guys in the hood. 
So I started to notice that this, as my transformation was taking place, there were certain things that I had to nip in the bud immediately. So there were things that I amputated, I guess I would say, very, very quickly. Um, things that I, that were not so external, but that were more internal, like, you know, the TV, the news and video games. And long before I became Jew, I started throwing out everything I felt was getting in the way of me and God. So it just went. I chucked it. I got out. I remember taking all my, man, my Jay-Z CDs, man, you know, I, like, man, I, went, I, was just, I took everything, threw it in the dumpster, dumpster. I was like, anything that was getting in my way of me becoming the me I wanted to be. I, I I had to change. And one of the biggest things was like what that was that was like one of the biggest challenges. And Hashim will challenge you during these times was I remember my, my younger sister, she was 13 years old and she got shot. She was at a party with somebody, her friend that was with her. He ended up getting killed. He was 15 years old, but she got shot in the leg. I think she still has metal in her leg to today. And I ended up finding out who the shooter was. Mm-hmm. Now you you have to understand how many people are just like, you know, but I know this kid. I knew this kid since he was a real little person. You know, the one who I'm shot saying? your sister? You knew the, the kid one who shot, shot my sister. sister. Right. So, which probably wasn't intentional for him to shoot her because they all grew up together, but but he had a problem with the other kid that he killed. So, but I'm 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 like in a crazy place because it's like everybody's telling me, no, you can't let it slide. Like you can't. And I, at that point, that's when I realized, like, I changed because I had nothing in my heart evil towards the person. Oh. And I realized at that point, it was like, I, I, I'm, I, I'm really changed. I have nothing in my, nothing in me, is, is, is upset or whatever. I'm just happy that she was okay. She lived through it. But there was these like breaking points I was going through to realize that no, I'm really changing. So. I had this amputation, but I was able to check in every once in a while to realize that certain things will happen to me to make me realize, no, I really, I really changed. So as, you know, further on, like I said, I got into the, to the lifestyle and to, into Judaism, the more and more that I gave up things, I didn't feel this major um, pain of like, how am I going to do this? Like, because I was, I was, I wasn't trying to prove it to anybody else, but I need to prove it to myself that this is for real. So one of the first things I did was I left music. Music was my love. That was my love. I made my last, I, I thought was my last album. And, you know, I did my last little touring and everything like that. And I and I said that I'm slaughtering my 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 Yitzchak. If Hashem wants me to have it back again, he will. But I, it, for me, it's over. Because I need to prove to myself, Hashem, that I'm all in. I'm all in. And so for me, that was like the... The, the the biggest thing that was like my my final my tip test you know and and eventually as, as you see it ended up coming back to me uh by way of uh of, of many different things about miracles and, and and feeling like this is what Hashem wanted me to do but I I really didn't I wasn't interested in trying to make those two things I just wanted that me that was buried inside of me to come out and like I said it was more garments more garments and as time went on I felt like that there were a lot of those different elements that I shouldn't, that I, that I may need to go revisit. I need to go pick up and pick back that, you know, it says that I think it's the Kesa Shem Tov, uh, the, the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov that bring down that, you know, at the time that B'nai Yisrael and also the Avot, when they went into Mitzrayim, when they went down to Egypt, why they go out into Egypt? What they come out with? They came out with treasure. They came out with a treasure. They came out with something. So in the times that you were down and wherever you came from, were you supposed to leave everything behind? I think so at the beginning. I think it's a very, it was very appropriate. But you have to realize that you came out with treasures. So you need to find and unlock all those different treasures to be able to use them for a time such as this. So um, so that was sort of my my relationship. As you, as you use it, I amputated it first. And then, you know, over time, I went back and started to, to collect these pieces. Wow. 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 Beautiful. Beautiful. Now, in regards to your music career, you know, I think it's like the biggest struggle for influencers, musicians, artists to niche their Mm -hmm. art. And so, you know, pre-Torah Judaism in your life, I'm sure Mm -hmm. your rap looked much different than what your music looks like today. 
-hmm. in terms of the the level of success that you have experienced in your life what has niching your music allowed for you right um so i sort of i'm a i'm a let it flow type of person so i try not to think about it so much um and whenever i do overthink things i always feel like i end up getting myself in trouble at least with myself later on so um <laughs> so so what I what I realize is that um, bec because I'm a person that 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 does anchor anchor my life in he both to do with some personal prayer with God and, and so I have this thing of always checking in of trying to be trying to be real right um, a person can find mistakes in trying to be real you can be so real that you're not being yourself also too so a person has to be even careful with being real right so. Um, this is why that that constant um, sicha and, and speaking with the shem to be able to to be able to have a constant and you know having rabbana close friends that are also growing not just friends because they're friends and you have stuff in common but you want friends that you have God in common that you're both looking for God in common with to always check in so the reason why I say all that is because when I look at like I feel like I'm in a niche position musically. I, I borderline really inside of Jewish music in a place where people that generally don't listen to Jewish music will listen to me uh, are people that have been growing up and they and 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 they were either bought Shuva, maybe, and they didn't listen to Jewish music. They've been like trying to force feed themselves for many years. And it's like, oh, wow, now I have something that doesn't feel like it's in this in this box. All the way to people who like were raised from and they and they only listen to like Jewish music. Like I will never listen to anything Jewish, but I can I could do me seem black. That's like wow wow wow. I didn't know that there was something over here. I didn't know that there was a talent in this type of music. Um, all the way to people who are not Jewish at all, who just like love God and want to be inspired and hear music that 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 doesn't have somebody being sworn at or cursed or killed every five seconds, right? Um, so be, because I'm in that unique space. Or I would say that I, I, I have a unique unique space and a unique niche because my experience has been unique. I don't have the same story as everybody else. Right? It's always like somebody said to me, you know, and they weren't being mean or anything like that, but they asked, like, you know, did, when you came to, like, South Africa, did you feel, like, more at home? Like, you're around a bunch of other black. Did you feel like that? Did you still feel out of places? Like, first off, you have to understand, I'm a Hasidic black Jew. No matter where I go, I don't look like anybody else around me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if I'm around the Hasidim, my body looks different. I'm around everybody else, my lavush looks different. My clothes look different. Like, I'm never fitting in with anybody, you know? Even in my neighborhoods, ultra-Orthodox, you know, I'm for sure the only guy wearing Yeezys over here. So it's like, you understand, like, it's like always somewhere it's just like, it just doesn't fit. So, you know, I remember, I remember, I remember before, after like Motherland Bounce came out, right before it came out, there was a lot of other record labels that were like really taken. I remember a good friend of mine, he, he took it, he, he was like dealing with some exec at some record label. I think it was an Island Records or something like that. And he just showed him a picture. He was like, I want to hear what that sounds like, you know? And it's like, you understand what I mean? Like, it's one of those things where it's like, well, of course it's going to sound something crazy different and, and the experience is going to be different because... It is different. So I feel like the, the niche thing just sort of like comes along with the whole whole package. That it's something I don't overthink about. And any time that I ever have, I felt like it threw me off my game. Wow. 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 Do you ever go back to Seattle to visit? Um, every once in a while, I have been back to Seattle for business-related things. I usually, while I'm there, I'll visit. I'll like extend the trip. But I'm usually only there if I have something, some business to do. Um, and what, what's that like? What's that like walking down, you know, the streets you grew up in, but dressed as a religious Jew? And, you know, do you feel like the guys are still your guys? Do you feel different from them even? Like you said, anywhere I go, I feel different. Like what, when you walk through the streets of Seattle, what does that feel like? So in 2018, I think it was Khan TV here in Israel, did a documentary on me. There was a few different... Um, uh, artists they did also on God Elba, Zusha, I think Lieber Schmelzer and Monty Steinmetz. They did like a five part documentary. Each of us had our own episode, and mine's was at least the most crazy and dysfunctional. 
I didn't say it's the best. It was definitely <laughs> probably on some line of the most entertaining, right? Because they took me back to Seattle. And I didn't see my family, like, really and been around them, like, maybe by six to seven years prior to me going back. So um, even when I was in Seattle, I was, I was still, my lifestyle created a distance, right? Um, so I went back, and that was just, like, crazy, the amount of love and 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 acceptance and 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 everything was real from my family to my friends that I grew up with. I was walking in my old neighborhood, showing people like, you know, where I grew up at, and and everything was love. You know, everything was all love. I was I was surprised, you know, because I I wasn't so aware of how everybody felt because I didn't. I you know when I when I really started my journey, I wasn't so interested in knowing what everybody felt. Like I, I wasn't running from, but I was running to something and I was running very fast um, in terms of trying to chase that light and find my inner soul and where I was trying to be. So I didn't really know what everybody else felt. Um, I would hear here and there or my wife's family is much more so at the beginning. They kind of thought we were crazy. They probably still do. But um, in a major way, I think it's been all love, even even from her side, you know, like, you know, and those type of things. Sometimes you miss like you miss family, you miss things like that that you haven't seen in a while um crazy enough like i miss just like seeing my brothers and my brothers in law you know like in different things like that like so you just still do have those i'm still a human you know um but but the the experience of coming back and being completely different something that you never had is like wild you know cuz what happens then is like people respond to you differently you know what I mean? There's a different level of respect because people see what you've done with your life and the different things like that, that you were so strong in your point. And I think I think I've inspired a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Wow. Wow. All right. Well, for time's sake, I feel like I could just keep flowing with you for hours. And there's so many more questions that I want to ask you, but we'll we'll, we'll keep it at this because um, I'm sure I'm Thank sure you, you have what to do. Uh but Thank you. There, is there any last piece, you know, just what would you like to leave the listeners with when it comes to, um, you know, coming into a spiritual lifestyle, maybe feeling different, feeling like, you know, do I really belong? Do I not belong? How do I find my place for people who are asking these questions and having a hard time really f finding their place in any religious environment mm -hmm. or spiritual environment what advice would you leave these people with all right so it's, it's very good that you asked me that because um i'm gonna think about this a lot you know i'm 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 very um i'm very jewish i'm very um pro-jewish i'm very i know that all sounds weird um i'm very comfortable in, in my yiddish guy um however with that said e even though I left, you know, at least two other faiths. Um, I I still meet people that are godly people from those other faiths, right? People that are very godly people, people that are very very well invested, and I know that amongst the lay people from everybody, that there's always people that feel a little bit more disconnected than other people. Like the main thing for me is that people have to understand this, and this is huge. It's something that it. it it takes a lot of work on it, but the relationship between God and everybody says, oh, relationship with God, like, it's a real thing. Like, it's a real relationship that has to be worked on. And it's something that that God on his side is welcoming at every single moment, at every single time of a person's life, that God is, is, is always making moves, calling out to the person just to come closer, to come a little bit closer, come a little bit closer. And, and, and what he's asking for us to do it's to spend time with him, right? To spend time with him. You know, I'm I'm married. I'm busy. I'm a career. You know, how many times I have my wife say that I need you to spend time with me. It's like, oh yeah, that's right. That's why we signed up for marriage. I have to spend time, right? And make that time. So it's very very important to spend time with God and spend a lot of time with God because what happens? I've said this before, is that when you have two friends that spend a lot of time to with each other, that then usually they start to they start to mirror each other. Um, and really the one who has the more dominant personality usually rubs off on the one with the lesser personality. And they almost become essentially the same person. You know, they laugh the same things. They, you know, it's they start to sound the same. 
I make a joke sometimes, but it's true that some people end up looking like the dog because they spend so much time with the dog. So like once there's a relationship there that there's been a lot of time that the person spends with the shim, then naturally a person is going to become more godly. You're going to achieve the things that you wanted to do in terms of your, your spirituality. You're going to feel that connection to God. You're going to feel that presence. That's, that, that's an added bonus of being in this world and trying to live a more godly life is the fact that we'll be able to feel him. And there's something about when the soul is speaking to a person and they know that that's their soul speaking to them, that they don't feel like, you know, when they go in to talk to God, that, that nobody's there. They know when Shem is talking to them. You know, they can feel that. They're not going to hear anything unless they're, like, really on a very, very high level. But I'm just saying that that's what I will leave people with is, is make Hashem your best friend. Make Hashem your best friend. And that's the way to build a, a positive and a real everlasting strong relationship with them. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Nisim. Thank I feel you. Like you, you. you are walking and talking your truth and your answers were also, you know, I, I, I think I speak for all of us listening because I'm reading what people are writing in the chat. We could hear, listen to you for, for hours um, and you just, you just have an authentic, this authentic energy to you. You're real um, and just easy to talk to. So thank you so much for this thank conversation. You. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to save it on my wall. So anybody who wants to watch it, who didn't get a chance to, they can. And again, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, have a good one. Bye.